Now it's time for Culture Talk, where we talk about culturally relevant topics that you can use to start conversations about your faith. And I'm joined today with astrophysicist Hugh Ross. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, my pleasure. We're going to be talking about an exciting topic, something that a lot of people wonder about, and that is, is there a life out there? So as you know, as everybody knows, the James Webb Space Telescope released these beautiful pictures and people were both fascinated and also had a ton of questions, even some things of feeling both significant and insignificant. So much um, resulted from just looking at the vastness of the cosmos, um, particularly the image of the deep field. So I'm going to um, read it here. It says, that image portrays a tiny sliver of the universe, equivalent to the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. So when we saw that image and saw all of the galaxies in that tiny little sliver of the universe, people thought um, a lot of things. There are so many thousands and thousands of galaxies that led to a bunch of different questions for them. But I want to know, what were your initial thoughts? Well, you know, I posted four of those images Mm -hmm. on my social media pages, Mm -hmm. generated over a thousand questions. So I've been busy answering all the questions (laughs) that I've been getting from people. Nothing I've ever posted before has generated that kind Mm -hmm. of a response. And I think what blew people away is just looking in the background of the images and just Mm -hmm. seeing thousands and thousands of very distant galaxies. And basically they realized, wow, this universe is a whole lot bigger than I ever imagined. Mm -hmm. So I was able to explain to them, yeah, but make it the tiniest bit bigger, we wouldn't be here. Make it the tiniest bit smaller, we wouldn't be here. And James Webb has really shown that to lay people in a way that the Hubble couldn't do. In fact, I would show the Hubble image side by side with the James Webb image, Mm -hmm. and it's just a mind blower how much more we can see Mm -hmm. with the James Webb Space Telescope and the beauty of it all. So the heavens declare the glory of God. I mean, if you live here in L.A. like we do, mm-hmm. you might see 30 stars in a clear night. <laughs> but with a James Webb telescope, we can see billions of galaxies. Yeah, it, I, I still think about it and think of how breathtaking it was. But, you know, it, it brought a lot of people to wonder. It's, the questions here are, how can we possibly believe that we are alone? And I remember reading that and going, that's a, that's a good question. Because if that's just a sliver of the galaxies, how do we know? How do we? How can we assume that we are alone? Another question that came up um, is that some people um, think that it's naive or even arrogant to think that we are alone in the universe. That surely we are not alone. Um, is it possible to know whether we're alone or not? Well, it depends what you mean by being mm-hmm. alone. You know, astronomers have this rare Earth doctrine, mm-hmm. uh, which is the idea that Earth is likely alone in its capacity to support advanced life, mm-hmm. but it may not be alone in its capacity to support a primitive bacterium. Mm-hmm. So if you're talking about sharing the universe with a bacterium, yeah, maybe we're not alone. Mm-hmm. Well, that question is still up there. Maybe this is the only place where you only have bacterium. But Everywhere we look in the universe, and James Webb is really bringing bringing this out, everywhere we look beyond Earth, we see conditions that are hostile Mm -hmm. for advanced life, but not necessarily hostile for a few microbes existing for a short period of time on another planet. And James Webb has not yet been used for this purpose, but one of its big goals is to look at the chemistry of planets orbiting other stars and to see whether the chemistry there has the appropriate uh, composition and abundances to make possible the existence of bacterial life. Mm -hmm. That's one of its main objectives. Wow. So we'll we'll see. I think within a couple of years, we're going to know the answer, whether there's bacteria out there. But one of the things I reveal in my latest book, uh, Design to the Core Mm -hmm. here, is that when we look at the very large scale structure of the universe, Mm -hmm. we see these super, super clusters of galaxies. They're not candidates for advanced life for a variety of reasons, Mm -hmm. but a supercluster of galaxies might be. But we live in the only supercluster of galaxies that we've seen so far that has the appropriate characteristics to make advanced life possible. Then we zoom in to the cluster of galaxies we belong to and we see that it's unique. We zoom into the local group that we're part, local group of galaxies. We see no other local group that's like ours with the characteristics to make advanced life possible. 
that extends to our galaxy. We've looked at galaxies far, far away. None of them are candidates. Mm. And so on all size scales, from the very largest size scales, all the way down to our star, our moon, the system of planets, even the system of asteroid and comet belts, they all have unique features that we see nowhere else in the universe that make possible our existence. And then there are astronomers who basically have determined maybe advanced life after us, mm -hmm. but we have to be the first on the scene because we're here at the bare minimum time mm. in the history of the universe. It's not possible to bring advanced life earlier in the history of the universe uh, than where we are right now, uh, which means that if there's life elsewhere, they would have to be sending a signal to us mm -hmm. that takes time and that's ruled out. They can't be earlier than us, they must be later than mm -hmm. us. So maybe in the future we won't be alone, but right now we're alone if we're talking physical intelligent life. Mm -hmm. Well, you said maybe in the future, so like in the future, we're, let's say we're here and, and... Well, what I mean by the future is say mm -hmm. like a, a half billion years into the future. <laughs> Which by that time... I probably time, won't be here, but you know... Well, not only will you not be here, there'll be no life here because mm -hmm. the sun's getting brighter and brighter. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it won't be long before it's so bright that photosynthetic life will not be possible. So I mentioned that this book, that happens in just a couple mm -hmm. of a million years. Yeah. Well, my question was going to be, like, what would happen if life does exist elsewhere? It, intelligent life exists elsewhere, how would that affect a Christian worldview? Well, it would have no effect at all because, uh, you know, just like we see supernatural design to make our existence possible, mm -hmm. there's nothing preventing the creator of the universe from supernaturally designing another place in the universe. That could be, it's just that we haven't found such a location yet. And Christians have been debating this for 2,000 years. It's not a new debate. Mm -hmm. And there have been people on both sides saying, well, God seems to really love creating. He's not going to stop at one planet. Mm -hmm. And there's others who say God only needs one planet to fulfill his ultimate purpose. Mm -hmm. So you've got people on both sides. I think we always will have Christians on both mm -hmm. sides because you really can't scientifically rule out a God supernaturally intervening in a place where you haven't looked. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've i heard you tell stories about hosting stargazing nights and how, regardless of people's worldview, they all are in awe when they stare up at the night sky. And it leads to those big questions. How do you engage those questions and share your Christian worldview? Well, it's one thing to go online mm -hmm. and see a Hubble Space yeah. Telescope image or a James Webb Space mm -hmm. Telescope image. It's a completely different experience when you actually look through a telescope and see it with your eye through the telescope. And people are just in awe of what they see and it just leads to questions. Right. So I frequently will set up my telescope on some high mountain range. Cars will drive by, they see the telescope, they stop, they get out. Mm. So uh, we engage uh, strangers in considerable numbers uh, just through that and it always leads to philosophically significant right. discussions. Are we here? what's beyond the universe, uh, what's my purpose in this vast yeah. universe, questions like that. You know, um, in addition to Design to the Core, you have another book that I think is wonderful in addressing some of those questions. They're why questions, and it's yes. called Why the Universe is yes. the Way It Is. That one I think is very helpful, because I know for me, as an LA native, I didn't see a lot of stars, I certainly didn't see the galaxy until I went and left the state, and I looked up in the sky, and I saw the well, Milky Way. good news, way. Sandra. <laughs> a 40-minute drive from here, mm -hmm. you can get high enough up and away from the city lights mm -hmm. where you can see the Milky Way with an naked eye. I'll, I'll need the map for that. But okay. <laughs> the first time I saw it, I felt so small. And, yes. and I was in, in complete awe. And your book is really helpful, I think, in helping address those why questions. Because it's like, why are we so small here in this vast, vast universe. So thank you so much for helping unpack this a little bit. Again, for, for viewers, if you want more, go to support.reasons.org. You can get Dr. Ross's book, Designed to the Core, and I would also recommend his book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is.